The Summit Series was historic in many ways. If you're too young to remember, it was an eight-game battle between the first ever Team Canada and the Soviet Union, a battle that was as much about hockey as it was about Western values versus communism. And joining us now for more, here's Paul Henderson. It's so good to have you in that chair. I can't believe I've been in journalism 30 years. I've never interviewed you before. Well, you never asked me. That's why. <laughs> that can't be the case. Well, this is long overdue. I'm so glad. I want to take you back um, to that time more than 40 years ago. And I, I start by, by saying this. I have once asked Ken Dryden, what was the golden era of hockey? And he said, whatever you were watching when you were 12 years old. So when I was 12, it was 1972. Yeah. So this is indelibly inscribed in my memory. And I want to sort of have you tell us, before this series started, how'd you think it was going to go? Well, I knew they were good hockey players, but I really thought, like, we had the best of the best. We had 12 future Hall of Famers on that team. And uh, I figured that we would win. I, I really felt we'd win seven games. If our goaltenders had a bad night, theirs had really had a good night. Uh, then, uh, I, you know, they might win a game. I, I didn't think we'd blow them out, but I think we, we could beat them 5-2, you know, 6-3, something like that. Because of, when you think of the firepower we had, their goaltending, and I really felt their goaltending would not stand up uh, to the NHL quality. So we were very confident we would handle them and handle them very easily. And then game one in Montreal, you take a 2 nothing lead, and yeah. you must have thought my theory's unfolding before my very eyes. No, au contraire. Au contraire. <laughs> I actually scored the second goal. And Ronnie Ellis and Bobby Clark can remember this. I came back to the bench and I looked at them and I said, guys, this is going to be a very long series. Uh, we just knew that they were so, their conditioning was unnerving, their skill level, and uh, they, they played a different game than we did. And I just knew that there was, they were a sleeping giant and we were in a lot of trouble. Imagine that. Score, we're leading 2 nothing. I say, gentlemen, this is going to be a long series. Everybody on the team knew it. And that game ended 7-3 for them. And when you got back into the dressing room after that game, let us in on some of the conversations. Uh, well, we were shell-shocked. I, I remember telling my wife after the game, I am glad I'm not Harry Sinden because we need a new game plan. And there's going to be major league changes in the lineup uh, because they, uh, they broke every rule in the game. I, I never felt so sorry for Ken Dryden in my life. Every time he thought they were going to shoot it, they passed it. When he thought they were going to pass it, they shot it. And uh, major, major league wake-up call. Uh, did that wake-up call happen because you guys just didn't take them seriously enough? Well, in a degree, we stayed with them half decently for two periods. But then the third period, they, their physical conditioning was unnerving. But their skill level uh, was unbelievable. And they, they were a team. They would played together for a year and a half. We were a bunch of good hockey players. And we were, you know, we had our own style. And we were certainly not a team. And when you're playing against a team that has a game plan and execute well, you're in trouble. And we were in trouble. Not only that, you were obviously an all-star team made up of, you know, made up from team, teams in the NHL. Did you go to that training camp, short as it was, to prepare for that, thinking, I don't like you, I don't like you, you know? <laughs> oh, for sure. I, there must have been some oh, of that, Oh, there's right? no question about it. Uh, I, I think the, the, the great thing for Ronnie Ellis, Bobby Clark, and myself, the first practice they put us together. And I remember saying to them, let's show these guys that we could play hockey. And I really, they told us we'd all play at least one game, but I really wanted to play in Toronto. And so did Ronnie. And then, of course, I didn't know Bobby Clark very well, but you didn't have to uh, give him much of an impulse to do anything. And so, basically, we really worked hard. We worked our buns off. And we were fortunate because Bobby Clark was just a younger uh, Norm Altman, really, who Ronnie and I had played with for five years, and so uh, a lot more aggressive, probably. But we didn't have to make much of an adjustment uh, to play with Bobby, and then things started clicking, and we started. Uh, we really got a little confidence because we were we started beating up on the other lines. We played a red-white game. Our side won 5-3. I got two of the goals, and Clarke got a goal. So, uh, but we came to camp in probably better shape than most people. But when we got there, we just wanted to prove that we could play because we were definitely underdogs to get into the first couple of games. Game one in Montreal was a disaster. Game two in Toronto, though, you win 4-1. to one. Are you thinking at that point, okay? 
Oh, well, we knew it was going to be a battle, that's for sure. I mean, Peter Mulholland scored, uh, I wanted to kiss him, uh, one of the best Pretty goals goal. ever scored at Maple Leaf Gardens. Mm -hmm. I said, we were shorthanded. If he doesn't score that goal, it could have easily gone the other way. So, I mean, it was, it was very satisfying. Okay, now we've got our feet on the ground again, but uh, we knew it was going to be, we knew every game was going to be a barn burner. Of the first four games, though, in Canada, that was the only one you won. And I wonder, as you're leaving, I guess it was Vancouver for the last game, having only won one of four games in Canada, do you think at this point it's still possible to win the series? No question about it. I, I don't think anyone has ever thought that we were, we just didn't entertain losing. Uh, and I, you know, and I said, well, fear is a wonderful motivator, but I said to my wife, I said, if we don't win this series, especially when we lost the first game in Moscow, I said, if we don't win those last three games, we're gonna be known as losers for the rest of our lives. And, but by that time, we basically got down to, we knew who was basically gonna play for the last three games. Because, uh, you know, when you got 35 people, you can't keep everybody happy. Mm -hmm. Because if you're, if you're on the bench and you're in the stands and you're not winning, and you're a Hall of Famer, you're saying, get me on the ice. And so there was a lot of turmoil. I'd have hated been the coaches of that team. But, but here's the thing I don't get, because one win out of the first four games, you are going to Moscow. Yep. You are going to be playing on Olympic size ice, which is bigger than any of you are accustomed yep. to. They're already a better skating team than you, so they like the bigger ice. I'm not sure where this notion of, yeah, I still think we can win anyway, comes from, given all of the disadvantages you were about to go find. Well, I, I, well, for myself, uh, I, I really thought that I would do better over there. I mean, I had my assets were my speed and my shot. And the bigger ice surface, uh, I really felt this would be into my, uh, into my wheelhouse. And the way I played the game, the better hockey players I play with, the more skill that they have, I'm going to look better. I'm not the, I wasn't a Gilbert Pro going to stick handle through the whole team. The only time I ever did it was in the seventh game. Uh, and so you play with good hockey players, you give them the puck, you get into the open, they'll give it back to you. And so I was really anticipative of the bigger ice surface and uh, of course playing this quali uh, caliber of hockey. And so my confidence level was high. And even though, even in the first game in, uh, in Montreal, our line scored two goals and we only had one scored against us. Mm -hmm. So we knew that we could compete against them and compete well. What about the rest of the team? Did you have any fears about them? Well, no, well, they used to kid me. You, Cornway, Mahovlich, and uh, Esposito. And you got, I mean, uh, the, you know, the gag line didn't start very well, but the, the superstars that we had. But unfortunately, some of the guys just couldn't find the right teammates. You know, they just couldn't get a line together. Where Clark Ellis and I, right from the start, I mean, we were on go and we, uh, you know, we gelled together, we knew our game, and we were really good defensive hockey players. All three of us were really concerned about our edge of the ice. And so the, the coaches knew that we were not gonna be a liability defensively, and then, and we were basically shut out as a shutdown line, Ronnie playing against uh, Karlamov. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I got on a little bit of a roll and uh, scored five goals in the last four games, and I, it was helpful. I think that's more than a little bit of a roll, but we'll come to that. I think the great revelation in this book for me was the notion that if this series were being played today, you would not even have been allowed to play game eight because you were concussed. You want to tell us how that happened? Well, I was, it was actually in the, uh, in the first game in Moscow. Uh, I came in from the side and a guy cut me down and I was going so fast, I got spun around and I went into the boards backwards and I went in so, uh, my skates, the toe of my skates went into the boards and I was knocked out. I had no, I, like I didn't have a clue. And Jim Murray, the doctor, you know, examined me and uh, said, Paul, you have a concussion. I mean, a pounding headache. And, and Harry come in, and, and uh, Jim told him, he says, uh, you know, Harry, he's got a concussion. He cannot play. Harry Sinnon, the coach. Yeah, Harry Sinnon. And I said, Harry, don't do this to me. Like, don't take me out of the line. I want to play. I said, I will t I, I will t I'll protect myself. I'll protect myself, but please, please let me play. And we talked to him for a little bit, and he said, well, Paul, he said, if you really want to play, I'm not going to stop you. And so, but today, there would have, I mean, I would have never been let back out on the ice, but uh, that's why I'm not too bright today. I should have gone back. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's interesting. That decision would have been taken out of your hands had it happened today. Oh, no question about it. Would never have been allowed uh, back on the ice. And in hindsight, do you think it was a good idea that oh, you did go back out? Are you kidding me? <laughs> the goal of the century, that I would have missed that? I mean... It was uh, like I was, 
but yeah, I, I knew this was an opportunity of a lifetime. And so, but we, that's the way we played back then. I mean, you know, I had six concussions that I knew about during my career. And you just didn't want anybody else in the old six team league. I mean, you didn't want anybody else to take your position. You're worried to losing your job. I was with Detroit Red Wings. And I was a right winger, and we had uh, Gordie Howe, uh, Floyd Smith, um, Bruce McGregor uh, on there, and I was the fourth guy. Well, Ron, uh, Ron Murphy, who played left wing on Norm Ullman's line, got hurt, and there was no left winger, so they put me on a line with Norm Ullman. For the next eight years, Norm Ullman was my center iceman. And so I took that, and I never played left wing until I, I that was, first shift. I was and say, so you shoot, you, you shoot right. So I, I shot right. Won, first, I never played. I always wonder why you were on yeah. the left side. Well, Ron Murphy got hurt. Huh. They put me on there. It worked out so well. Uh, Bruce McGregor and Norm Ullman and myself were known as the hum line, and I played left wing for the rest of my career. <laughs> Uh, I know it, game eight is, of course, the most famous goal you ever scored, but game seven oh, was yeah. the prettiest goal you ever scored. Can you describe that no one? No question about it. Well, we went out, the, the score was tied, and I, I figured this was probably going to be my last shift of the game. And I remember going out there, and my confidence was up because I'd scored a few goals, and I said, I really need to do it, uh, this shift, because I may not get another shift. And I, I, oh, how I wish we've been watching this goal for the last 40 years <laughs> rather than the last one. But, you know, it was a one on four to start with and beat them all and put it in the top corner. And, uh, man, I love watching that goal. Best goal I ever scored in my life. Was, and I yeah. said to Eleanor after the game, you know, sweetheart, I will probably never score a bigger goal the rest of my life. Because if I don't score that goal, the last game means absolutely nothing. Right. And series then is two over. days later, I score what I call a garbage goal. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever remembers the other one. That was a pretty good garbage goal. Yeah. But um, can you tell us how you managed? Like, did they do something wrong that enabled you to split the defense, get in there, and get that chance in Game 7? Well, I, I was a, a little bit of a lucky. I went in, and I, I was going to try to move to the inside, then put it between his legs, and you know, hopefully get around last time, because they figured I'd go to, the, to my forehand. But it hit the inside of the skates, came out the other side. And, and I could feel myself going down, and I knew I had to put it in the top corner. And as I was off my feet, I actually rifled it under the crossbar as I was going down. Yeah. I love watching that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, game eight, a minute to go, and you actually do something that the code of hockey says you are not supposed to do. What did you do? Well, uh, I, I, and I, uh, Steve, I can't even explain it today. I found myself, it was almost out of body. It was totally unpremeditated. I just, something impelled me that I had to get out on the ice. And so Peter Mohavlitz was a left winger. And I started yelling at Peter Mohavlitz, Peter, Peter. And uh, thank goodness Peter thought it was a coach yelling at him. And Peter came off the ice and I jumped over the boards. And, you know, 10 seconds later, it was all over. Did he wonder when he got to the bench and saw you coming on for him, what in the well, hell is going on here? <laughs> well, Frank told me afterwards, I never really talked to Peter about it, right? Frank told me, he said, he was sitting there, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And Ronnie Ellis, of course, but uh, it was just something within me uh, said that I needed to get out there. And Peter never went back to you after the game and uh, said, what are well, you doing we never me talk, Are you kidding me? That you never, just, you know, it was the best thing ever happened. But hmm. can you imagine, though, imagine I call Peter Mohavlitz off the ice, the Russians go down and they score and we lose the series? See, I'd probably be living in Siberia today, <laughs> not in Canada. <laughs> the puck goes in with 34 seconds to go, and I was interested to read that your first reaction was not elation. It was sadness. It, it, was, it was amazing. Uh, my dad died in 1968, and I was a lot closer to my mother than my, was my dad. And I had, n I had no recollection of thinking of dad before I scored that goal. But when the goal went across the line, I actually said out loud to myself, dad would have loved this one. And I actually thought of my dad. Of course, it was only a nanosecond, and I jumped into Cornway's arms. But, you know, there's that father-son bond, maybe so deep. But actually, imagine that. Dad would have loved this one. Hmm. And uh, there was that touch of melancholy, and, but I haven't, celebra I haven't stopped celebrating for 40 years, so I've made up for it. Your dad gave you some interesting advice in teaching you how to play uh, the game. <laughs> which was, you know what I'm talking about here, right? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Go in and aim for his head. Oh, yeah, well, back then when we were, you know, growing up, the goaltenders didn't wear, uh, didn't wear masks, and my father, and I could shoot the puck well, and uh, so he would always say, son, the first shot you take right at his head. 
and you intimidate them, you know. And uh, my dad was a big, big, strong man, strongest man I ever met. He weighed about 280 to 300 pounds, and he was legend. Of course, I, my mother never weighed over 100 pounds in her life, and thank goodness I had more of her build than my dad, but he was a pretty aggressive guy and uh, wanted me to be a hockey player every, much, uh, every bit as much as I did. You fulfilled that dream of yours and his, oh, yeah. uh, but you also tell us in the book you, weren't, you didn't, have, uh, didn't have a fabulously close relationship no, with your dad. No. Having said that, uh, how proud do you think he was of the success that he managed to see you have? Because he oh. didn't see you score that goal, Oh, obviously. yeah. I, I knew he was very proud of me. There, no question about that. He was uh, very, very proud of what I was able to accomplish. But, you know, with one of those relationships, is we never, you know, and he died. I was only 26 when he died. And we never really had those real, you know, like good man-to-man -man talks. Or, and I was looking forward to get, you know, as I got older, getting to know him. And then, of course, he died at 49. And wasn't able to really get to know him in a deeper way. How did he die? Took a stroke right out in front of our home. He, he actually took a, 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 a heart attack when he was 42 and they told him he probably wouldn't live that long, and, but he was so strong he lived till he was 49. But he was out with my brother. I was away and my, he was with my brother and, uh, and a, one of my brother's buddies had a motorcycle and dad raised his hand to say goodbye and Bruce said, he just said, oh, oh. And, Bruce said he was dead. Uh, my brother Bruce said he was dead when he hit the ground. Was Fort it related to his oh, being yeah, overweight yeah, and all of that? Yeah, it took a heart attack. Hmm. Well, he was a big farm boy, you know, and he was, you know, eating a half a dozen eggs and a half a pound of cheese. Uh, and, you know, the cholesterol, his, his arteries closed up. Um, hmm. Okay, I'm going to take you back to after game eight now. You see Vladislav Trechak after the game. Yes. What would you say to each other? Well, I congratulate on him being a great uh, goaltender and... Uh, through an interpreter, he says, you were very lucky to score that goal. <laughs> what did you say back to him? Well, I, I can't repeat it now. <laughs> but I, my, my, uh, my answer is I was not a Christian at that point. So I didn't compliment him, put it that way. Did you use profanity, Mr. Henderson? Uh, I, well, uh, I can't seem to remember, but <laughs> I definitely used profanity. Well, I think you might have. I think you might have. Did you think, though, I mean, when the chips were down, Ken Dryden pitched a shutout in the third period, and Vladislav Trechak let in three goals. Yep. And I know the world's conclusion after that series was, boy, that Trechak was fantastic. Did you think he was the best goalie in the world after that series? Well, I didn't, whether he was the best goaltender in the world, but I tell you what, he could have played in the NHL. He was a very mm -hmm. confident goaltender. I mean, he made some incredible saves. I mean, you're playing the best in the world, and you, can, uh, and you hold your own. Uh, that's pretty high. Uh, you know, people come to me all the time. You know, how can he be in the Hockey Hall of Fame when you're not? I, I, I really believe he's a Hall of Famer. Hmm. Where's the jersey you wore during that game? <laughs> well, see, because I had six concussions, okay? Actually, the, when the series was over, I gave it to Joe Scro, our trainer. He was a good guy. He always took care of me. Uh, with the Toronto Maple Leafs, he was our trainer, and he was our Team Canada trainer also. And so, I, you know, there was no memorabilia market back then, and I was never really into that. And so I gave it to Joe. And he kept it for uh, 20 years, and he sold it in 92, I understand. And What did he get for it? Uh, five grand. Five and then the grand. guy that bought it, <laughs> I tried to buy it back. I offered the guy 25 grand uh, because I wanted to give it to the Hall of Fame because I had the other one in there. But they wanted like 35 or 40 grand. He eventually sold it for 60. Then in 2002, a guy in the United States knew nothing about hockey, but that was his business. And uh, he bought it for 160,000 and then he kept it. And actually, he, I was diagnosed with cancer in November of, uh, of 09 and he was diagnosed the same month, but he had pancreatic cancer. And so, you know, he had a timeline and so he put it up for auction and uh, sold for $1.27 million. Unbelievable. One of my grandsons said to me, Grandpa, what were you thinking? If you'd have kept that thing, I could have gone to Harvard. <laughs> but Many I blame times. the six concussions. Holy cow. Uh, and and I, he, the man who had pancreatic cancer, I presume, has passed yeah, on since then? Did, yes. People have come up to you over the years. And the funny thing is, again, reading in your book, they don't ask you what you thought of the goal. They all want to tell you where they were when you scored it. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. They want to tell me where they were. They want to tell me who they were with, uh, uh, how they felt, and, and, and what they did afterwards. What's and so crazy I just story? sit there. Oh, well, I, I, like I've heard so many, but 
uh, I was thinking of the, this one guy was telling me they were up on the Trans Canada Highway and they were driving and they'd go down and they'd lose it. So they got up to the top of the hill and they stopped the car so they get near the end of the third day. Then they get, there was another car pulled in behind them and then there, it turned out there was three cars so, and they were all listening to the hockey game. Well, when I scored, they got out of the car and they were just went crazy. They were <laughs> hugging and kissing and all this kind of nonsense and I guess it was a little town. And so they end up in a bar. The three cars, they go in there, and they got it. And he says, we got so roaring drunk, Paul, we had to stay in that place all night. But he said, we became fast buddies, these three cars. Never met before, but they just went crazy on the side of the road. You saved a marriage, Paul. That was the most satisfying one. Yes, uh, I got a letter from a lady at Christmas time uh, of, uh, of December 72. And she says, Paul, I want to thank you for the best Christmas present you could have ever given me. September 28th, my husband and I had decided to get divorced. He came over to our home, and I was gonna, we were both gonna sign the divorce papers, and it was all over. The start of the third period, when he came there, and the start of the third period, he asked me if I could come in and watch the third period. And so I let him come in, we weren't talking or anything, and, and uh, just being quiet, watching the game, and then Esposito scored a little, you know, celebration. And then Cornway scored a little more. He says, "When you scored, we went crazy, just like every other." And we were hugging. We found ourselves hugging each other, and we looked into each other's eyes. And he said, "To make a long story short, we reconciled that day." My husband came back. We spent that night together. We put our marriage together. He said, I know if you hadn't scored that goal, my husband, I would have signed the papers. He would have walked out of here and would have been all over. Is that a great story or what? Amazing. Yeah. You won a Memorial Cup in 1962 with the Hamilton Red Wings. Yes. But I wonder whether there's any lingering sadness over the fact that while you played in two Stanley Cup finals, you never won the cup. <laughs> I tell you what, that, there's one of the most, you know, regrets in my life. Uh, we lost it twice, and uh, like I, I'm still not over it. Really? I, I'm still not over it. It's just like every person that plays in the NHL wants to have your name on the cup. My first year, 1963, uh, I'm playing for Detroit Red Wings. First year in the NHL, first year of pro, and we're playing Toronto. We're leading three games to two, game sixes in. Uh, in Detroit, I get a breakaway and score. And if that game in the second period, if that goal stands up, we win the Stanley Cup, I got the winning goal. And then Billy Harris, who hadn't played much hockey, come out and scored from a scramble near the end. And then that wimp, Bobby Bond, came out <laughs> in a broken leg in the overtime and went off Bill Gadsby's stick into the top. And then we come back and we lost the last one here in, uh, in uh, Toronto. And uh, like I cried. Like I cried. And then in 65, we go into Montreal. We win the first two games in Montreal in the finals. And now we got it. We lost the next four games by one goal. And, uh, and it still is it's a craw in there. Thank goodness 72 came along because it would have been awful. You're serious. 50 years later, this still bugs you. Still bugs me. Still bugs me. And I'll tell you what. Any, like I'd sooner lose in the first round then go to the finals and lose. It's just such a, like all summer, you just, in, in the what ifs, you know, if I'd have done this or you'd have changed that. And, uh, and it took me a long time to, to really reconcile the fact that I don't have my name on the Stanley Cup. Hmm. You, uh, in our last few minutes here, I do want to talk to you about your health because you've mentioned that you contracted cancer or whatever the correct expression is. And you've been fighting, if I can say this, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah for quite a while, and allegedly there's no known cure. That's right. But you look damn good, Paul <laughs> Henderson, so what's going on here? Well, I was very fortunate. When I, uh, when I was diagnosed in November of 09, totally out of the blue, I always have kept myself in shape, and I weighed 184, played for 180, and I was still 184. Worked out all the time, and I went in for a regular checkup, and they did an ultrasound on my stomach, and found some gross biopsy. We did do an operation, a little biopsy, and. Uh, so I was diagnosed with lymphocytic lymphoma, chronic leukemia. But with what I found out, they don't treat this, your longevity, early treatment does not help your longevity. And so they wait till your tumors, uh, the lymph nodes get too big. And so they said, I'd probably need chemo within a year, a year and a half. And I really started working out, got on a very strict diet, and done a bunch of things. But then in this, uh, in, uh, in 12, uh, the spring of 12, they said that I would need to, I'm probably going to have to do some uh, 
uh, and start treatment because I was, there was one was like 16 centimeters in my stomach. And so we looked around and very, very fortunately, we got into a, a, a clinical study in Bethesda, Maryland. And I started in September of last year. I weighed 162 when I went down there and my, I had a lymphoma the size of a grapefruit. And I just came back there a couple of weeks ago and uh, I am back up to 180 right now. Uh, that uh, growth is now the size of the end of my finger and I'm doing very, very well, uh, unbelievably well. And so uh, we're hoping this might be the silver bullet. It's an experimental drug at this point, but the, the people I've been on for like seven months now, uh, there's people been on it for two years. So we know that it works for two years, but whether it comes back after that. So, but I just take today, like I just, I got today. And so I'm going to have a, I, I'm going to enjoy today. And if I wake up tomorrow, then we'll take a shot at tomorrow. But you have to wake up tomorrow because we're going to do one more part in this interview. Well, that would be a good idea. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for today. We talked hockey today. I want to talk faith tomorrow. Everybody knows about your hockey story. Uh, they may not know as much about this. So we're going to come back tomorrow and talk about that. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.